I'm Tim, he's Mike, and welcome back to Around the Crown, a Watchbox forum on topics in Rolex. Today, we've pulled some of our favorites from the Watchbox inventory. Impressively, just one of these watches is steel, and even that one is an exotic. Mike, why don't we start with that one? Oh, let's definitely start with that one. So that's the Yachtmaster 2 in steel. Um, when it first came out, I always loved this watch only because of the size. I love big watches. This was kind of a beast. The Yacht Timer, I love the size, I love the weight. I didn't end up getting it only because it doesn't have a date, which is always a pet peeve of mine, um, just a personal thing. But it's great balance and I love the blue bezel. Now this one is a special edition one. Yeah. 100 years of the Panama Canal. This is from the opening of the canal in 1914. And this is a limited edition with a 768 country code for Panama, sold in Panama City by a dealer called Mercurio, which is a famous jeweler from the region that customized the case back to celebrate 100 years of the canal. Really, it makes it rare because again, Rolex doesn't really do special editions. There are a lot of pieces in Rolex that are limited just because of production and rarity and just, they don't make a lot. But to find one that we know is limited to a certain number, makes it really cool, makes it collectible, and uh, just an unusual piece. And I believe the edition though. number was 150? 150, exactly right. Now this is a fun watch because it is the steel model. So if you want the Yachtmaster 2 to wear, most people are gonna say go with the steel. It debuted in 2013, it brought an updated movement that was more stable, more reliable, and it is the most complicated Rolex watch ever made. This is a memory, programmable, fly back, fly forward, countdown chronograph. It's an amazing piece. And I just, I guess, again, I love the look. There's something bold about it. There's something that pops when you wear it on your wrist. It really does, it's distinctive, especially in Rolex. It's not your traditional steel sport watch with a black dial, um, and it's got that pop of color. And it is really cool because the bezel is part of the movement. Correct. And it's not just a flyback. People don't realize that this is a movement that can also fly forward to the nearest minute. All right, you're gonna start making my head hurt okay. now, but well, that's okay. The, the uh, point the is... <laughs> Caliber 4161 is the bomb, guys. This is the rock star. And what's really cool is that actually Rolex started thinking about this type of regatta timer back in the late 80s. The first patents they filed were for a quartz watch that used a retrograding style countdown hand. Oh, that's cool. This actually has, this came out in 2007 in precious metal, 2013 in steel, but its roots go way, way back. Awesome now we're gonna piece. jump forward. This is a very recent release. Eisenkiesel from Rolex basically means, well, you tell me, what is this? Well, it's a fairly rare stone. Uh, yes. Part of the quartz family, very cool. Just a distinctive new stone for Rolex. And now again, you know, we go back in history, 20, 30, 40 years, you see the early stone dials. They were super rare. It was typically onyx, tiger eye, some malachite. They even went into woods at times. But to have a new stone come out was a shock to everybody. And, and that's traditional with, with the Date 8. It's often been a canvas for the most exotic Rolex dials. Correct. And again, in very small quantities, because if you look at the details of all the stone dials, you know, the, they're outlined in gold. They're very, very perfect examples, and they're very hard to work with. So by drilling into them, they're breaking a lot of dials. So they don't produce them in large quantities. So all of the stone dials have become collectible over time. This one, interestingly enough, kind of flew under the radar when it first came out. And you know, outside of the 40 millimeter, this is the 36 version, yeah. we don't get a million calls for it, but I still think it's a sleeper. I it, think this watch in 10 years, you're gonna look back and go, God, I should have grabbed it. No contest on this. And here's the thing, there are several versions. You can get it in 40, you can get it in 36. Correct. You can get it with full diamond bezel or just diamond numerals. And I think this really is the sweet spot. The 36 millimeter case, gold when it's too big can be overpowering. It's a nice rose that, is actually well matched to the color of the dial, which Correct. is brown. Yeah, it really blends beautifully. But when you look at the detail of the dial, it is really incredible. If you loop it and get that the veins that go through it, it's just, I love that. Piece. Yeah, the marbling is unique to each one. So Correct. it's not like you're gonna get a series of these and they all look the same. No, every single one is distinctive. Now you do get the diamond numerals, which I think actually is probably one of the best ways for a guy to wear diamonds on a watch, because it's subtle. You don't notice it at first glance. You see it at second glance. There is a full diamond bezel available. I like the smaller size. I like the gold fluted bezel. I love that they chose to do this in rose gold, because for yes. me, it's a perfect match perfect dial match. the case. Now, would it be an, it'd be an odd 
combination in yellow or white, I think. Yeah, it'd be a little bit intense. And, you know, frankly, I think you play to the natural material. When you've got wood, you play to that. When you've got lapis, you play to that. When you've got stone, well, there this, you go. this is how you do it. This is reference 128235, a very cool piece. This is from the latest generation. Came out in 2021, as you see it right here, so it's still a relatively new addition to the catalog. Uh, but this one right here, th this is a long-running tradition. It's actually two traditions on this dial right here. Tell me about this. Two traditions is right. One, you have your classic gold Daytona, which we all love. Uh, Mother of Pearl, you know, another natural material that's amazing in the coloration. This is a, a black Mother of Pearl, they call it, so it's that very dark Mother of Pearl as opposed to traditional white. And then you've got these gold subdials that are just amazingly done. And again, when you get into the detail, when you really get in close on this, you can really appreciate the work that goes into that dial. Yeah, so you've got the meteorite style tinted subdials. You've got the mother of pearl, which is black Tahitian mother of pearl. People think, well, it doesn't look black. Well, black is relative in the world of mother of pearl. <laughs> Correct. It's a spectrum of colors. It has excellent chatoyancy or this, this sense that you're looking at a cat's eye that has depth and luster and prismatic effects. And then you also get the gem setting. So you get all three of them in a very compact space. Yeah, in a very wearable space. And I mean, I just think, again, that's a watch that I keep staring at. And every time I look at it, I like it more. You know, when you first look at it, you're like, oh, maybe it's too much. But then you really get into it and start studying it, and it just grows on you like crazy. The other thing that I really like is that it's a Daytona, which means there's no date, there's no Cyclops eye. All of this, the diamonds, the oxidized sub-registers, the mother of pearl, it would have been overpowering and somewhat crowded if it were one of the models with a date. On a Daytona where it can be balanced, no date, no magnifier, it really works better. Yeah, and the, the, the contrast of the sub-dials, I think, is what makes that. Also, you know, impressive, it's Rolex's own movement in here, which I still think is an interesting, rugged, versatile, accurate, and trend-setting movement caliber 4130. Back in 2000, that was really the dawn of the in-house caliber Daytona. And here we are now, it's still an impressive movement. This is still anti-magnetic, shock-resistant, 100 meters. It's everything that a Daytona is traditionally, but I don't see this as a racer's Daytona. Like, It is no. not a racer's Daytona at all, but it's really, what Daytona's become a little bit more of is you've gotten into the rainbows, you've gotten into uh, the John Mayers, you know, it's become a little more iconic where the different variations really pop and it's the distinctive dials and color combinations that really make the new Daytona's pop. Yeah, a few hours south from Daytona Beach is Miami Beach, <laughs> and that's exactly where this watch belongs. belongs yes. Exactly. Okay, I'm going to pull one of my favorites. This is the veteran on the table right here. Uh, this is... A date eight oyster quartz. Correct. Um, now this is the one nine zero one eight in yellow gold. Its serial number is 1979-1980. It's in the six million range. It's a 36 millimeter watch, but like all watches with integrated case, lug, and bracelet, it looks a little bit bigger. It's very much of that era when this was the style. In that era, we had the Jumbo Engineer, we had the Nautilus, we had the Royal Oak, we had Gerald Genta's own Rolex 5100 Texan, and this was in Genta's view, a continuation of his design that he created for the original Beta 21. Without a doubt. And the thing I loved about this was, you know, again, back then, this was like early days when I, I remember selling 1901s and selling Barks. And like the signature statement watch of the day was a gold watch on a bracelet. Um, you know, there wasn't the Steel Daytona craze. Steel Daytonas were still not even appreciated at the time. If you had really accomplished something or really marking a milestone, it was a gold Rolex. And that was really what it was. It was a Piaget Polo. It was all those big, chunky, even quartz watches back then that people were impressed with the accuracy. Um, it was just a great piece. And this one, just again, the dial makes it so distinctive. Yes, this is the Jubilee dial. If you've ever seen that repeating Rolex, Rolex motif, that's called the Jubilee dial. It's also got wonderful translucent electric blue lacquer over it, which makes it very unusual, even by the standards of the period. This is an extravagant watch. It has radially arrayed Arabic numerals in yellow gold. It has matching metallic yellow day and date discs. And because it's an oyster quartz, it's very rare. Most oyster quartz were the date just. Correct. And over 25 years or so, they built about 25,000 of all oyster quartz models. So most of them were not the day date. Now you're talking about a quarter century and 25,000 watches of which this would have been the minority. That's rarity. And normally in the world of Rolex, that's not common. Right. Rare that's is point of the realm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's outside of their normal standard. So this is, and it's a statement piece. I mean, it really pops. I mean, again, that's when you look at across the room and you cannot miss it. Yeah. Came out in 1977. Every single 
Date 8 Oyster Quartz was a quartz chronometer. Decatalogued around 2001, 2002. A very unusual watch. It had one of the great quartz movements of all time. This quartz movement has a Swiss lever escapement because they wanted a precise locking um, non-backlash action to the seconds hand. They wanted it to be exactly one hertz. They wanted to have no shake, no stagger, no tremble. So they used a conventional Swiss lever, which this movement has. It is a, an 11 joule movement. It is thermocompensated. It is a quartz chronometer. It's accurate to about 60 seconds a year. And it even has a quartz trimmer built in because this was designed to be a lifetime movement. So over the years, as the quartz crystal drifts, as they call it, the Rolex watchmaker can actually use the trimmer to Adjust. back it back into the correct timing. Uh, so a very special watch, and even more special, the fact that because the bracelet was fully integrated and non-removable, the reference number as well as the serial number is on the underside of the case back. It's, it's on the underside of the lugs. Exactly. You can see it right there. It's just a great piece, and just a great piece of the period, which is what I love it. It's just so distinctive to the time, and it just brings back great memories. Now, I've got it. one that's a bit of a counterpoint to that, because this one is not much newer. This is a 7 million serial, borderline 1982, 1983. Here we have a traditional mechanical winding, chronometer spec. This one is the 19039, I believe. 18039. 18039, exactly. 18039. And what's nice here is that it's a transitional. Um, it's got a rare 30-55 movement that's a single quick set. So it's not no quick set, it's not double quick set. It's got a lapis lazuli dial, which is gem set. It's made of white gold, and that's where the 18039 comes in. The nine means it's gonna be white gold. It's a 36, just like the Oyster Quartz, and what's interesting to me is how different they are. This one is on the President bracelet, which we associate traditionally with the Day Date, whereas this one is on a bracelet only ever featured on the Oyster Quartz uh, the 1530 and the 1630. So this is a very different look, but they have that same ambiance of being a flagship watch, something a president or maybe a president for life, you know, dictators, would wear. <laughs> and it's but beautifully preserved. It is beautifully preserved, but it's also just, again, we talk about this all the time, but every single stone dial is different, and this one is as bright as one as I've ever seen. Yes. It pops across the room. It's just screaming. And again, we did sell uh, white gold pieces back then, but it was not something that was common. No. Though it was yellow gold, and then it was tridor. We would sell much more because back in the early 80s, tricolor jewelry, tricolor style was in. You wanted to stand out. You wanted to stand out. But a white gold was so subtle, and to have a subtle white gold day date, very expensive piece, and to then to have a stone diamond dial on it, Super rare. In a lot of ways, this, with the lapis lazuli dial and the set gems, is sort of the, the Eisen Kiesel's forerunner. Like the, the, This is the grandfather of this right here. And the fact that they're both day dates really speaks to Rolex's willingness to kind of experiment with that collection. I love that. No, it's a great point, because that really is the same DNA just of a different period. Yeah, so if you want a single quick set, white gold, lapis lazuli, gem set, Rolex day date, single quick set, this is the first one I've seen in eight years of doing it. So this, well, this this is an old friend. This watch I've seen before, but Mike, you're gonna have to reintroduce us. Well, so GMTs, again, one of the most iconic complications. I'm a big GMT guy. I love all my GMTs. I've had a love-hate relationship with Diamond GMTs for a long time. Yes. Um, only because at when they first introduced them, I mean, it's a lot of watch. Um, and where I was and where the clients we sold to, it was almost too much watch for most of the men that would do it. And women certainly weren't wearing this size watch back 25 years ago. Um, it's really something that was a very special, very collectible piece, but for a very rare customer of the time. And I remember the first one I ever sold, we had special ordered in for a customer. We were all excited. He got it out of the box, looked at it and said, I hate it. <laughs> It's, 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 so I had a small heart attack, and I've always been a little sensitive about Diamond GMT. You either love or you hate this. No one's like, eh, maybe. Never, <laughs> no, ever. No. Never. So now this is watch. Uh, this is the 116758 SANR. It came out in 2006, and it's part of a very, shall we say, off-the-radar series of Rolex watches that are released without much announcement and sold without being cataloged. Correct. So this is not something you would ever see on Rolex's website then or now. This is not something that your garden variety Rolex boutique or dealer catalog would have included. You had to know to ask for it. 
Correct. these were handmade watches. All of the gems on the lugs, on the crown guards, the bezel, and the dial are set by hand using the same techniques a 19th century gem setter would have used. So these are truly the last handcrafted Rolex watches because the gem setting is so labor intensive. The dial is a disc of solid gold. Correct. And Okay, I'm not going to say that it's bashful in any way, but it's not as, shall we say, tome-like as a standard Rolex dial. You have Rolex, and then you have GMT Master II, nothing else printed on this dial. It's not advertising with a depth rating. It's not telling Correct. you that it's automatic, that it's an oyster. No, it's very clean. Yeah. I mean, they're giving the attention to the diamonds, Yes, as, as they should in this case. But it's one of those pieces that, again, so distinctive, and uh, just becoming more and more over the last five or six years, more and more popular, more and more guys are like, yeah, I can actually pull this off. And they assume if you spend high five, low six figures on your GMT, you're gonna know that it is an oyster case, a perpetual automatic winder, a superlative chronometer. This watch lets the gem speak. And one thing I love is that there is some subtlety to this watch, not just in the color contrast, but on small details dial side, where the hands and the indices are blackened for better contrast against the dial base and to key with the gem set into the bezel. And it is a diamond paved watch. Lugs, crown guards, bezel, and the bezel still works. Now mentally, you're have to make note of what hours you're looking at, but it is still a bi-directional rotating detented GMT bezel. And that's one of the things I love about Rolex is the DNA of every watch is a tool, it's functional, even when they're making things that are more jewelry, yes. it still has all the DNA of a true Rolex, and that's what I love about it. Now this is a fun piece because it's yellow gold, and you need panache to pull that off. <laughs> It's not for a shy man. That is definitely above my pay grade, I think, but uh, I do really appreciate it. Yeah, I think we've decided this is Miami Beach, <laughs> Sunset Strip. The choice is yours. East Coast, West Coast thing going on here. All right. That is an absolute blast. You can find more watches like this on thewatchbox.com, and we'll see you next time around the crown.